All right, welcome to episode 82 of Seize the Moment podcast. And this next guest requires no introduction, but I'm gonna do it anyway. He's a Hall of Fame, semi-retired professional wrestler, three-time WCW heavyweight champion, fitness instructor, motivational speaker, and actor. He's the creator of the world-famous DDP yoga program, and he has a new documentary out on Amazon called Relentless. I wanna give a huge, huge welcome to Diamond Dallas Page. Hey guys, I appreciate you uh, waiting for me. I was still a little bit late, but uh, better late than never. <laughs> Absolutely. We had, we had to give you the Michael Buffer entrance. <laughs> <laughs> I used to love it when Michael Buffer would introduce me, man. Oh, I loved it, man. Because, you know, watching all those great fights. And now my favorite introduction is when he, uh, it did me and Goldberg. That was, uh, I was out. That was a really big deal that night. Yeah, man. Halloween Havoc 1998. Oh, shit. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Wait. Oh, all right. So we kind of had a structure for this, but since you brought it up, can you tell us about that night? Cause that was actually one of the best matches I've ever seen. Oh, thank you. You know, it, it's suspended belief and, you know, and that's what you do in wrestling when wrestling really works, you're trying to, you know, make people believe, you know, and, and uh, it's like a great movie, you know, like in the movie, you know, he didn't really get shot. Yeah. But how did he sell his death? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so the behind the scenes stuff of that is I know Bill six years before he ever comes in wrestling. I met him in a strip joint mm -hmm. and we just clicked. And I was with Bischoff. And I'm like, hey, you got to meet this guy. This guy could be something in our business. And I'm playing football and he really wasn't into wrestling. But, you know, he liked it, but he wasn't really into it. And um, bottom line is, one day, I mean, I don't know what town we were in, but Sting and Lex walked by with Bill. And I walked out and go, yo, Goldberg. He's like, hey, DDP. And he'd come to meet Bischoff, and that was the beginning of it. And then he would be down the power plant. So I trained with him a lot down there. Because I still hadn't, when Bill first came in, I still hadn't gotten my push yet. You know, so when I, when I wasn't on the road, I was down in power plant training and teaching everyone because the more you teach someone, the more you learn, the more you learn, the better you get. So I got to work a lot with Bill, you know, back then. But then Bill blows up huge. <laughs> you know, I'm huge too, but Goldberg, we all know what kind of an impact he had in such a short period. And um, I said, okay, during this match, bro, you're going to miss the spear. And here's where he goes, oh, no. I go, no, dude. You're, I'm going to lay this out. It's going to be genius. Trust me. You're going to miss the spear. He goes, I can't miss the spear. <laughs> that's my thing. I, I said, that's why you have to miss it. <laughs> and, I mean, for three weeks, he, like, he would deliberate it with me, going back, like, and giving me the reason why. And I kept going, no. This is what we're doing. We'll go to the we'll go to the power plant. I'll walk you through everything. This is what we're gonna do. And if you watch that spot where he comes running, I kick and he staggers, and he comes to spear me. He's not coming to miss me. He's coming to spear me because he don't want me to get out of the way. And I don't remember how I even came up with that holding on the ropes and it's him coming, kicking my legs over the top. But literally, he just, by a quarter of an inch, misses me. And I don't know what we would have done, you know, if he would have got me there. But I got out of the way. And he hit his shoulder on that post. Because for Bill, a lot of it had to not just feel real, but be real. And... Bottom line is, you're supposed to look like you killed him and you didn't, you know. But Bill was very green, you know. He was, uh, he hadn't been wrestling a year and a half at that time. And um, we get to, you know, to the, the ending. And I know he's going to go for the jackhammer and he picks me up and he puts me down. I'm thinking, holy shit, he's actually selling. But uh, what had happened is I didn't know this, but right before he gives me the jackhammer, I'm going to let him spear me. And what had happened when I came up and he went this when he did spear me, 
Like I, I would consider it, I'm a napkin. Like if you hit me, that's what's going to happen. It's like, I'm never going to be there. And I'm going to feel as heavy as a napkin because I'm going to be gone. Right. And if you watch that, Goldberg's head hits his the first. Right. If he didn't have those huge traps, I guarantee you, he might have been a quadriplegic. But he did have those crazy traps. He hit. Now I roll off to the side, bring in, he goes to pick me up. He's knocked out. That's why he picks me up and he puts me down. I don't know that at the time. And then he picks me up with one arm because mm -hmm. his other arm is fucked. Yeah. <laughs> and I flip behind him and I hit him on the cutter. And uh, I knew he was going to kick out, so I'm going to wait a long time. And he's supposed to kick out on two and nine tenths. <laughs> One, two, and he kicked out. I was so pissed off because that was a moment. They exploded anyway, but it even would have been bigger because you're building to that moment. And Afterwards, when he, I went to hit him with a jack, you know, hit him with a jackhammer, and he turned it around and hit me, and you know, he hugged me, pulled me up, and I look, really look at him. I go, "How the fuck could you kick out at two? He goes, "D, I don't remember anything." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Well, you remember to kick out, you rat bastard. You could have stayed out for that." But, uh, <laughs> Crazy. What a uh, it was. I tell you, it's one of my. Absolute favorite matches. I'm looking at a buddy of mine who just came to see me, uh, marvelous Mark Merrow, also mm -hmm. known as Johnny B. Bad. And there's matches that you had, like Mark and I, no one believed that we were going, you know, the, to be worth anything at, you know, at the spot that they were putting us at. Because they got to put you there, right? And me and him work so hard. We go out there and you walk to watch any of our pay-per-view matches. You're going to go like, damn, that was the beginning of us really learning how to own the crowd. And uh, it, it all comes from, you know, working together. That's why those NXT matches are so amazing. Those guys spend so much time together, you know, that it becomes like, like when me and Mark, it was like, we knew what we were going to do before we did it, you know. And, and you know, um, the Goldberg match, we didn't have that much time on, but it was it was a magic match because people were really they thought that was going to be it and i didn't know this till much later on but dusty had uh gone to eric and said you know it might be these night tonight you know yep and the reason that dusty said that that uh eric didn't do it i don't know if this happened or not because i never even asked eric about this i don't know why i never asked him um but he said that you know goldie was going to be on um, Entertainment Weekly, wearing the belt that Monday when it came out, TV Guide, everything. And he was the face, you know. Um, but it would have been great for me to beat him there and then have him beat me the next night. Yeah. And the reason why I said I didn't do that, because you couldn't put it up right away, you know, the pay-per-view stuff. And then they had to put it up there. And that rating was like an 8-2, which was insane. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's considered by some literally to have been one of the greatest matches in professional wrestling history, not just WCW, just wrestling in general. Yeah, it was an amazing match because, again, you had Michael Buffer, you know, the huge introduction, yeah. you know, and then, you know, we followed 40 minutes of Hulk and Warrior, right. which was not their best, you know, didn't work out that great for those guys. But so the people were really, they, I didn't know where they were at, but I didn't care. You know, like, I'm going to go out here and we're going to kill it. And we did. Yeah. And I remember at the time you were pretty much the rock of WCW, which was so cool. They could have just handed you the belt at that time. And people would have been like, yeah, no, I believe the DDP be a Goldberg. They, they really, you know, and, and that, and if Bill, who just did a really amazing, uh, he was doing, I guess, his, um, his uh, video that's up on uh, WWE right now on the network. And they had asked him something about me. And he just said something that was just so powerful and cool. And, uh, you know, and, uh, he actually choked up on it, which is pretty cool. Because he know he knew that that was the match that really, like, got him respect. 
that he fucking could go. He could go. He was a great athlete. That was his spot when I sweeped his leg. And he freaking came right back on his feet. You know, like at 298 pounds. That's a hell of an athlete. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. And then also just being able to, you know, pass out for parts of the match and then continue. Like both of you. Yeah. Right? That's great. Mark, yeah. I just had to be sitting here thinking, Rudy Omni one night, and he walks up and he goes, did you see that match? I said, yeah. He goes, I don't remember any of it. And I've been there. I've been there where I'm walking backstage after Randy Savage landed on my face at, uh, at Bash at the Beach. And I'm walking backstage and I look at Kimberly and I go, did I just wrestle? Wow. And she looks at me and she goes, what'd you say? I said, I just wrestled. Is this Nitro? Wow. She was stopping pages, scaring me. I go, what the fuck? I go, is it Nitro? What's happening? She goes, no, it's a great American bash. You just wrestled Randy Savage. I said, what happened? And what had happened, Scott hit me with a bell. Scott Holes, no DQ. Then he hit me with the, his, you know, razor's edge. And then Randy, who I've been saying, please stop landing on my ribs. I've been pissing up blood for the last three straight weeks, land on my stomach, and he landed on my face. Wow. And if you watch that, they were screaming in the back, go home! Because when it gets to three hours and one second, it changes channel and goes to whatever the next thing is. In some places, they could go long, but a lot of them, they couldn't. And as it's ticking down five, Four, Scott Hall comes in, raises Randy's hands. You'll see me sit up just a little, and I lay back down. Thank God. It goes to black. Kimberly said, I sat up after that, came to my feet. They're like, they turned around like, what the fuck are you doing? You fell between the ropes. You gave them both the finger, and now we're backstage. And I was like, uh-oh, that's bad. So I went, I went in the locker room and I stuck, stuck a table in front of me and they kicked that door in. They were mad, mad, mad. And I, and I understood why, but I didn't know it. I was out. And, uh, you know, they're, rah, 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 I go, I, you guys knocked me out. I have no idea what the hell happened. Rah, rah, rah. That's through the table. I'm not going to argue about it. Like, if you think I'm bullshit, let's go. And they're like, <laughs> walked away and then I felt something in my in my in my teeth and it felt like a pee then it felt like a, a golf ball by the time I got to the emergency room it looked like this so it was like I had my fist on my face it was they were like you you had a, a real concussion and you shouldn't wrestle for two weeks I was in the main event against Bret Hart the next night you know, what was it going to stop? You know, plus I had no idea about concussions. Yeah. You know, you're used to like shake it off and keep going. And uh, that next day, my face was still swollen. I got that picture somewhere. Oh, you have around here? I got, I got so many of them. I got, I knew I got it somewhere. But I waited at the bottom of the, where all the trucks come in and the car all the boys come in at, you know, in a big stadium. You got to, it's downstairs, you know? And I sat there on a speaker uh, box, you know, that carries the big speakers for this, you know, for all the sound. And I'm just waiting there for Randy to come in because my face is swollen. And finally he showed up and he walked up to me and he went, <clears throat> sorry, brother. <laughs> respect i mean honestly uh what yeah. other sport is as physically demanding as wrestling There's, i don't i can't I don't, football so there's wrestling and football no but come on 300 yeah fo football yeah. would be but they but they play once a fucking week right you know yeah. so it's every day you know. yeah and so and i think this is yeah, such a great you're wrestling yeah. yeah, and it's such a great pivot into DDP yoga. So obviously, kind of like your kind of baby and your bread and butter at this point. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How you discovered it, or rather, even how you created it, and how it differs from like the yoga that all of us know? Um, it's completely different than what the what people think it is. You know, that's for starters. Um, you know, I am that guy who wouldn't be caught dead doing yoga the first forty two years of my life. I'm I'm, I'm that guy. You know, I made fun of it. 
You know, I, I, you know, I'm not proud of it, but I, I made fun of it, you know, with my buddies. And it's a chick thing. And when I blew my back out, I mean, you have to understand, 1997 and 98, I, in 97, I was... Only Austin was was hotter than I was in 97. And 98, I was still freaking white hot. I made nothing. I made a quarter of a million dollars a year. Everyone else made seven figures or high seven figures. But I was waiting for the big payoff, my next contract. And if they didn't give me what I wanted, I was going to go WWE. You know, so I was waiting to see. And then I got it. And I got the big multi-million dollar three-year deal. And then I blew my back out. Yeah. Now, if I can't get back in a ring in six months, that contract starts <laughs> like disintegrating, you know? And uh, it was, wasn't as much driven on the money as it was on, I'm living a dream. It's not going to be over now. I just got here. And um, that's when Kimberly, really, my, my first, my first, uh, my first wife, my first ex-wife as well, <laughs> but still best friends and actually partner in uh, our DDPY program. She's partners, uh, one of the owners and uh, one of the huge supporters of it. But she's the one who really bullied me into trying yoga. And when I did, there was no modifications. Like I, even the best teacher I could find is a guy named Brian Kest, who's friend of mine today um he, back then today he has modifications back then he didn't have it so i had to figure it out in the first three weeks even though it was you know it felt like you know i don't know what the hell i'm doing and you know i'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit more movement and i'm feeling a significant difference in the first three weeks i'm still doing rehab for my back so I've also had rehab, both shoulder surgeries and both knee surgeries. So one night I just mixed the rehab with the yoga positions. You'll never hear posture or pose from me. I'm an athlete. I know how to play a position, get in a position. So it, it, it works for me. So DDPY positioning. So I mixed the yoga positions with the rehab, added in old school calisthenics, how to do them with a slow burn movement. And when you do exercising in a slow burn movement, every time you flex or engage a muscle, your heart has to beat faster to get the blood to the muscle. Mm. And what happens is you start to get a kick-ass cardiovascular workout moving slower, mm. which is really kind of crazy. And again, I figured it out by accident. The bottom line is today, you know, it's DDP Yoga will always be the company, but I'm branding it DDPY. Why? Because I want people to stop calling it just fucking yoga because it's not, you know. Uh, I get people all the time go up to me, DDP, DDP, man, I love your yoga. And if I've got like three or four people around me, or, you know, I'll just look at them and go, what'd you call it? Your yoga. And then I go, what did you ignore me? I'm wearing a shirt, you know. <laughs> what? The DDP Yoga, DDP Yoga. You know? But the main thing, branding, the branding of DDPY is actually working now. And if people will call something P90X, they'll call it DDPY. Mm -hmm. And do you guys know what P90X means? Oh, no. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I did the program. Do you know what it means? No. But do you know what? No, you don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what P90X means. So they'll know what DDPY is. Diamond Dallas Pages Yoga for people who wouldn't be caught dead doing yoga, you know? So, you know, it all, and I want to be still a part of yoga because yoga has lasted 5,000 years. P90X, that's gone. Tybo, gone. Yeah. Insanity, gone. Yeah. If I die tomorrow, today, two seconds from now, DDPY will grow stronger every year because it's real like we have this one i tell people don't listen to a word i have to say about my own program there's a site on facebook it's a members only a buddy of mine named chris gabriano started it for him and his buddies who did the program mm -hmm. now there's fifty five thousand people on there mm -hmm. it's a no judgment zone people put up those six pictures you would not believe 
what people will put up of themselves and the response that they get and how encouraging everyone is. So many people go there looking for some kind of hope, some kind of inspiration. And we're doing right now the Positively Unstoppable Challenge. It's a million dollar challenge. Third place gets 5,000 bucks. Second place gets 10,000 bucks. First place has a chance for 1 million. And what I mean by that is Positively Unstoppable, the art of owning it. There's a, a hundred of them in this cabinet. One of them has a million dollars. The least money you will make is 25,000. So this year we had unbelievable, like unbelievable turnout of people. Right now we've got, God, I don't know how many thousands of people have already signed up for this year because it's from January 1st to August 31st. Anywhere in between there, say the first two months you fuck off. And you know, you know, you're just not in it. Well, you decide to pick up in March 1st or March 20th or March 31st, whatever the hell it is. Mm -hmm. And the next six months you kill it, that's what you get to use. Mm -hmm. So we had, I couldn't break it down to three people. So I had to bring in and have a tie for third place. And I didn't split the money, 2,500 a piece. I threw another 5,000. That's my money. I threw another 5,000 because I couldn't, everything I do is how do I feel about me? And I didn't feel right bumping one of them, you know, because they were any one of them, any one of them could have won. So why is there two people in third place if anyone could have won? Because physically their change was unbelievable. The, the least person lost 72 pounds and the most was 95 in six months in third place tied was a guy named scotty jorgensen who lost 95 pounds over a six month period wow. and got down to 205 from 300 to a five and what a he's very funny he would put funny faces in you know what are you doing the pictures there's a guy named Dust, Justin Dobbins. The video's out there right now. Justin started two years ago. He's 6'7", 698 pounds. Wow. Wow. The first year, the first year, he, he lost 170 pounds changing his diet and walking. But his body was so beat up at the end of that first year that he couldn't do the walking anymore. So he said, I'm gonna try that DDP yoga stuff. In 23 months, he's lost 401 pounds, 401. Now, how do those two guys end up in third place? Here's, here's, the, here's the criteria again, physical change. Mm -hmm. Any one of them could have won. Mental change, any one of them could have won. Like, because positively unstoppable is all about rebooting your brain. Right. That's where the whole contest comes from. You know, and how do you, what changes do you make? What is the new story that you tell yourself? Like, who are you? Who were you? Because your video, if you're doing it the right way, right. you're videoing who the fuck you are. Mm -hmm. And then you're videoing who you are now. Mm -hmm. And the whole way through. Well, those guys only had pictures. You know, no one, none of them came into this contest thinking they were going to win. Mm -hmm. None of them. They came there to be inspired. As a matter of fact, I saw when Justin Dobbins joined that website, I just started to see a video. He said, here's where I'm at right now. He's down about 224 pounds at that time. And he said, I'm not here to win a contest. I'm here to help people you know, stay uh, accountable. And I'm going to do it with you guys. Again, I'm not here to win the money. I'm here because I want to be a part of this group right. that helps each other. So both of those guys uh, were in third place. 
a girl named Caitlin Kay was in it the year before, and she lost like 32 pounds. This year, she lost 72 pounds. And she, she was on, she did the workout every day. She was up there every day. But her, her content wasn't as personal as Candy's, who won it. And Candy, when you, her video isn't done yet, it's not up yet. The only one's up there right now is Justin Dobbins. But they'll all have one at some point. But when you see who Candy McCarthy Herndon is and where she's at and how lost she is, she talks about her mother, who was a drug addict, left her at the beach when she was like four years old. Wow. Just forgot it. Oh, forgot my baby sitting at the beach. You know, told her, told her that she shot up heroin like she was pregnant with her. Like, why would you tell me that? Like, when you see her face and you see her more, and like I said, anybody could have won it, but she did because she documented it. Now, let me give you an example. Everyone knows the video of disabled Arthur Borman, disabled right. veteran Arthur Borman. If there was just pictures up there, of his journey and some written stuff, you'd have been impressed. It would have been a cool video. Mm -hmm. But because he documented everything, his son, Warren, documented everything. That video will go on to inspire people a thousand years from now. Yeah, he, he started out not being able to walk. He was told by doctors he couldn't walk again. If if he tried to, he'd be walking with those uh, I don't know, the crutches, crutches yeah. right? And he tr he tried everything. He didn't know what to do. All of a sudden, he gets into DDP yoga. I'm watching this video, too. And I, I know you saw the video. And I see and with the music playing and everything. You see his journey, right? Starting out the exercises, right? Starting to get into it. Then you start to see him uh, lose weight. You start to see him become happier. Yeah, yeah one of our friends literally cried when she watched that video. Yeah. Yeah. No, so what, you, you're not you're not a human being if you don't at least get choked up. Yeah. Because it is powerful. You know, I love watching people watch it. You know. <clears throat> yeah. But again, that's what our goal is for this. Because you're not going to find any Arthur's. Arthur was, you know, that was a God sent him to me and me to him. You know, it was one of those things. And to tell you the truth, that was in 2007. Yeah. It didn't explode till Steve U changed it up. And next thing you know, we're viral. And I don't even know what the hell that means at that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I know it changed our life. You know, and that would be, the, you know, but then it was the resurrection of Jake the Snake. If anybody's watching, if you've never seen the resurrection of Jake the Snake, it is also on Amazon Prime. Yeah. And uh, resurrect, you know, Relentless is on as well now. And that's what I'm really trying to get people to watch because the more people watch it, the more it'll move towards the front page. And because if not, that's how Amazon works. How many viewers? That's why their stuff does so well because they push it like crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know? Right. Like, and in the, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, yeah, the Jake the Snake documentary was just phenomenal. And I remember, so I remember watching Jake the Snake. Well, first of all, you know, when I was a kid, but then also I remember seeing him in Beyond the Mat and it was literally a completely different person from the, oh, Beyond, the Mat, yeah, yeah. From the Beyond the Mat film to like Resurrection. And so I remember in the beginning of the documentary, man, I was just thinking that there was no way that this guy was going to make it through. He was literally like near death at that point. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, what was the journey like with him from your perspective? Well, I, I don't know where Jake and I come from first. Um, Jake was the first, like, he's the guy I respected the most besides Dusty Rhodes. Mm -hmm. um, I respect his talent, not really his lifestyle choices, <laughs> but his talent, how great he was. So when he actually told me, he thought I was going to be one of the top guys in the world. Yeah. I was 1993. It didn't happen till the end of 96 going into 97. So it was still four more years. And this whole thing was, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to be one of the top guys in the business. And for Jake Roberts to say that to me, 
You know, I always tell people never underestimate the power someone gives you by believing in you. You know, so, oh, you're just my mom. That's why you're saying that. No, your mother or your father, hopefully they do believe in you, you know, and give you that, you know, that inspiration, that power of belief. And of course, never underestimate the power you give yourself right. by believing in you. And um, Jake had helped me. And I know I'm not in this house and my business or anything without Jake helping me find that confidence to be able to achieve the goals that I did. So I tried to help Jake for years and he wasn't ready to listen. Yeah. But when I finally got to him and he saw Arthur's video, that's been, you know, my connection for everything. Like, okay, you want to know what I'm doing at Jericho? Your back's blown out. You can't wrestle anymore. Watch this video. He calls me up five minutes later. You tell me what to do and I'll do it. Right. Now, and Chris's diet isn't the best these days. <laughs> <laughs> People go, well, your, your program, if it was keeping Chris lean, well, then I believe in it more. I'm like, you can't out train a bad diet. Chris is having fun. Chris is having fun right now. The, the workout keeps help, keeps him in the ring, though. You know, it helps keep him in the ring. And uh, he's always been a huge supporter of our program. It's not about being skinny, it has nothing to do with losing weight. It just turned out to be an awesome side effect. Mm -hmm. And for Jake, he was 307 pounds when, when we rolled in to see him. And he was he was the worst I'd ever seen him, physically and mentally. And then as time went on, when he started to change and he started to believe, and the same guy who believed in me, I believed in him, that he could do it. Now, are there times where I questioned it? Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times the director, Steve Yu, who's one of my good my best friends and my business partner, <laughs> we'd look at each other after something Jake would do that you know, wasn't really the most positive thing and look at him, each other and go, do you think anybody's ever going to see this documentary? Mm -hmm. Because we weren't sure. I called it the resurrection of Jake the Snake before I ever went to see him. Yeah. Now. So, yeah, so it just it just we don't to help your brother it's, it's a big deal yeah what were you gonna say? Uh, well i was gonna say and the best part of that documentary i remember was when he walked into your room and he's telling you that ah uh, you know he got the call from vince he's not going to be in the rumble and he's kind of pissed off and then he's like oh but actually i'm in the hall of fame and you were like get the fuck out of here i think i fucking knew it that was really dope that was such a good part that was the best moment in the film to me yeah yeah um and with Relentless, I we, we show that piece in Relentless as well. And it goes farther because I'll never forget talking to Stone Cold. And Steve says, uh, Steve says, kid, if you can get stuck, if you can get Jake Roberts to turn his life around. Your shit is for real. <laughs> <laughs> That's an endorsement. <laughs> yeah. And there's so yeah, many. He, did, he, he thought I was crazy. He thought he was, because Steve, you know, Steve and I have a really unbelievable relationship. And he didn't want to, as hard as I worked, he didn't want to see like me put it, my faith in Jake and him fail. But I never saw it like that. I just saw it as I'm trying to help my buddy. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, I, mean, I go on to the next guy needs help. You know? Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, so it's like for you, your ego wasn't necessarily attached to it. You just figured, look, what? there's a guy, right, that was so substantial to my career. Like, I owe it at the very least to give it a shot for him. Yeah, and that's how I wanted, you know, wanted to do it. And look what happened. <laughs> I just talked to Jake the other day. He called up a one of our buddies who was running because we were filming here um, mm -hmm. workouts that we were doing and he called Garrett and I picked up the phone and go, hey, motherfucker, what are you doing? Hey! You know, like, you know, he got a pop out of it because he was looking for Garrett and I answered the phone. But um, 
you know, he's just in a really good spot. And, uh, you know, his health isn't the greatest because of the breathing part he's been going through right now. But uh, so far, so good. So hopefully he'll keep getting better. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing him on Rogan and I saw like what he looked like before when he wasn't doing so well. Mm -hmm. And it was like a completely different person. And it, it's, it's, it's really incredible what happened. And he sounded great too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then just, I remember kind of, um, well, actually, no, let me kind of shift it a bit. So a lot of what we talk about on the show is sort of about mindsets and the way kind of people see themselves, yeah. people, yep, the way people see the world around them, kind of how those mindsets help them, obviously how they stop them from success or kind of, they just stop them from, you know, even just kind of daily day-to-day -day goals. Mm -hmm. So for you, Dallas, what do you feel like, how do people change their mindsets? Right. And how do they go from, let's say one particular mindset to the other? And in particular, I guess, what would those mindsets be and what did they look like? Well, um, first, uh, I, I, I need to plug it. This is what I turn everybody on to. Yeah. Positively unstoppable, the art of owning it. It is exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It is that six inch piece of real estate in between your ears. It's the story you tell yourself. Yeah. And that, you know, one of my favorite quotes ever is if you say you can and you say you can't, you're right. And it's so easy to say, but. Then you look at the guy who said it, I mean, it famous Henry Ford, and you just got to think, what the hell did he ever do? Yeah, it's like, I can't do this. I can't do this. You're right. Don't bother. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it's like that little thing. You, and then if they try to teach it to people at an early age with books like The Little Train Who Could. I right. think I can. I think I can. I think I No, I can. I mean, like, we're already doing stuff like that with my granddaughter who's, you know, doesn't, she has speaks a little word like bye or night night or whatever. We're already putting those little things in her head, you know, little things in her head. You can do it. You can do it. You know, it's like getting, to, she's going to be the most positive driven kid ever. I hope. Um, I know if she's around me. That's all she's going to hear. And there's nothing you can't do. Oh, it's not just going to happen. Things that piss me off that are good, have really good intention, but kind of mix, miss the mark. And they made millions of dollars with that movie, The Secret. Mm -hmm. It had a lot of awesome things. You know, the power of manifesting dreams, you know, into reality. But when they gave the, the, the example of the little boy who's 12 years old, he just wants this red bike. I just want this red bike. To it. And I'm just going to wish it in the desk and want this red bike. And one day he opened the door and a red bike was there. Mm -hmm. I thought that is the biggest bunch of bullshit I ever saw. You know, now if he would have said, I've got this paper route. And every morning, there's no such thing as papers anymore. But back in my day, I got this paper route. And I'm going to get up at 6.30 in the morning. And I'm going to deliver all these papers. And I'm going to save up, you know, $84. And my dad will match it. And then I've got the your red bike. Mm -hmm. Then I get, you know, they left out the secret. The secret is you have to work for it. Yeah. Everything that I have manifested into reality, which is everything I have, <laughs> I've manifested in reality. Live in this ridiculous house. Has no mortgage. You know, freaking my businesses, my car, every, everything. I don't believe in buying shit without being able to have it. So I don't have to think about paying the bank. It's just my own thing. My girl that I've been with for a little over a year, year and three months, when I met her, she had no debt. She had money in the bank. She could do what she wanted to do. She is a free spirit, but has the same mindsets that, that I have. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, as far as helping people understand, they've got to surround themselves with positive energy. Po and, and we are all energy. I'm looking at my brother across the street. He, he's waiting for me to get done with his podcast. <laughs> and he, he's the most patient fuck alive. And he's sitting there. But these are things that we and him talk about all the time. You mm -hmm. become the five people you hang out most with. Like one of the things he says is your friends are like elevator. They mm -hmm. can bring you up. Or they can bring you down. So, like, when your mom's going, stop hanging out with those bad kids. There's a reason for that. Right. 
Yeah. I mean, there's like a, you know, they, they probably should try to explain that a little deeper. It's kind of like chew your food. Mm -hmm. They don't ever tell you why. You know, Cause really they don't know. Right. Like it's all about digestion and you really want to chew your food because you're not going to really absorb all of the food that you're eating if you don't break it up and break it down. So how it goes in your body. Um, you know, the thing that I tell people the most is don't watch the news. <laughs> don't not be not educated. Go watch the BBC news. Mm -hmm. You know, at least you're going to get a semi, it's not going to be argumentation. You know, it's actually going to be what people think the news is, yeah. but um, it's, it's really comes down to the story you tell yourself. Um, like when I went in the hall of fame, this is a good example. I had been in front of a crowd like that in 15 years. Now the story that could have been running through my brain is why would you write a 27 minute speech? What if your iPad freezes? What if they're not in it? What if you're not getting the reactions? What if you freeze? The only voice that was going through my head was, this is gonna be the greatest thing I have ever done in professional wrestling. I'm going to blow everyone away. I'm going to make them laugh. I'm going to make them cry. I'm going to inspire them. And that's the only words going through my mind. When I did my last match with AEW, it'll be a year ago, two days from now, the 15th. Yeah. And at some point, Cody goes, and then you jump off the top rope. <laughs> yeah. And I just sort of shook my head. I didn't, I didn't say yes. I didn't say no. I just thought, wow. Now in the beginning, I thought, what if I tear my ACL? Mm -hmm. yeah. What if I break my neck? Yep. What if? And okay, now you've got to, here's what you've got to do. You've got to get there you have to practice springboarding up to the top rope you gotta you know, there was a lot there was a it was a whole series of things i did ddpy on and off for five hours wow before i ever went out there and my body was so in tune and the only message in my brain from the moment i woke up that day was I'm going to kill it. I'm going to yeah. blow everybody away. This is going to blow the roof off. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to blow it away. And I, then I went down there and I felt the ropes and I popped up there. I went, this is killer. I own this. So yeah. it's about that story inside you, you know, and it can be really negative and scary. And that works too. Really negative and scary. And most times you're going to fuck up. Yeah. I almost feel like Brandon Lee, Bruce Lee's son yeah. willed himself to die at 33. Yeah. Because he told everybody he was going to die. He was going to die. He was going to die you know, before my, when my dad died. He was die when I died. And then a freak accident of a gun. That's why, if you're not an actor, you really don't notice. But when they bring a gun on the set, the gun is checked and boom and bop. And, it, and it's, it's not a real gun. Looks like a real gun, but it's not. And they make everyone check it out so they can see, not a real gun. Right. Because it was just like an old cap gun type thing back when Brandon got killed. And it was like, and the impact and maybe his manifesting killed him. I don't know. Yeah. But the power of your brain is everything. And like this crazy shit that's going on now. Like I have younger friends because I'm going to be 65. So pretty much everybody I hang out with is way younger than me. Yeah. And uh, um, they're saying like now you can't even, uh, you can't have an opinion. If it's not their opinion, they're, they're pissed. You know, they, they're, they're, they're condemning you. So what do you do? I said, you know what I do? I said, I think you both suck. You know, I think Republicans and Democrats, I think you suck. Mm -hmm. I think you are the worst representation of us as human beings. It's not just Trump. Trump's a total douchebag. And he really showed his ass big time. 
really bad moves, dude. But I don't think they're any better, you know, because they are bullying people at a, at a level that I can't even believe. The level of bullying people to believe what you believe. I mean, it's on every show. It's on everything. I just watched a, a comedian, you know, uh, girl, I can't remember her name, but I watched her just bully the hell out of Trump and and basically condemn anyone who thinks anything like uh, that, that they're a Republican. Forget, forget the fact. Like those people, ooh, they don't get to hang anywhere near me. You know, it's like, I don't want to be around that shit. I don't need, I think you all suck. How's that? <laughs> you know? it's the us versus them mentality, right? Like that group. Right. Thing. I don't want to, I don't want to be in that. I don't want to be, I want to be in a positive set situation, something that I can control and I get to control the way I act and react and take action. But the most important thing I control is the way I breathe. <sighs> Calm the way down. Have there been a lot of bad decisions made lately? Yes. Is the you know light at the end of the tunnel? Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. You know, am I going to take that vaccine? No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Not until they absolutely like won't let you on a plane without the vaccine. I had, I had it. I had uh, Corona. Me and my girl both had Corona. By the way, my girl's first name is Paige. Mm -hmm. Her last name is McMahon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when Jericho heard that, he uh -huh. laughed so hard. Uh, but, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's all about being in a positive mindset and stuff you can't control. All that election shit, fuck it. You know, the main reason I don't want to take that vaccine, I don't take any of that shit. Mm -hmm. I don't trust them. Truth is, not conspiracy theory. I just don't trust them. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, once I see it help a lot of people like the smallpox, if you go back to smallpox, it was a different world. I mean, in the 60s, there was a guy named Walter Cronkite. You know what he told you? The news. Yeah. He didn't inflict his what you should do or who this person was or how you should think. He told you the news and you trusted him right there's not one person on television that i can watch and go i trust that dude right and that's why that one so, right and that's why the data i think is so important sort of looking to see what the science says about vaccines you know even there's that but one thing that i think is important I, i've been thinking about what you're talking about too like there's not the one news source that everyone watches everybody agrees with everybody kind of has like alternate realities of kind of what's going on even though i like what you said about bbc that's interesting but um yeah i, I was hoping maybe one day we legislate something where you can't have that like you know how there's an algorithm online it tailors certain news to you based on like what you click on all that right 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 yeah, so I, I would love if that were taken away in regards to news and politics, because like the situation that we had recently, I think it's just because of that. Like, that's why certain ideas got as much momentum as they did. And like, why? No, I agree. Not? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I agree. You know, yeah. the, the bottom line is, I, I think we, we need to just, we need to be nicer to each other. And I heard one Republican, as I was flicking channels, say, and I really agreed with him, he said, we don't need to impeach him. It's just going to pull us farther apart. And I didn't look at it like that. I'm thinking, impeach the bastard. Get him out of there. You know? Then I thought, no, that's why. That's just going to pull people farther apart. Yeah. Just let him get through. Can't do much more damage. He's not going to push any buttons. He's got a family. You know, he's, he's, he's not Beelzebub sometimes, but, yeah. you know, but he's not, there's only a couple more days, you know, you know I can't wait till it's over, bro. And yeah. then there'll be some new crazy thing. I just, I, I pray they don't try to take our guns away because if we do, that's going to be fucked up. You know, and that's the only way to say it. It's just the way it is. You know, the place with the most gun laws in the country 
is the murder rate capital of this country, Chicago, right. Illinois. The worst. The place they tried to hold people down the most and trap them down has the most deaths, yeah. L.A. and New York. Right. They won't even let people from New Jersey fly in here now without two days out of saying they don't have a COVID test, a negative. Yep. I know because the guy didn't get into his hotel. He's friends with my daughter, Brittany, and uh, and he came and stayed with us for a couple hours. So, no, he got his negative test there. Now now he can stay. And that's where all everything's going. So, you know, but you go to Florida, you wouldn't even know there is COVID because they're still letting people live and, you know, restaurants go. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but their COVID rate is nothing like in the places where they're trying to wrap them down. I, I got it. And you couldn't have been any more careful than I was. And, you know, and we got it. It sucked. <laughs> but glad I have it. And I've got the antibodies. So we're doing the plasma thing. Yeah. You know? Just yeah, give them back to help people out. Yeah. So, and just to get back to your career. So there was a question that I wanted to ask you who came from a friend of ours. So a philosopher named Douglas Edwards, he ended up writing a book about the connections between philosophy and professional wrestling called Philosophy Smackdown. So he's a big fan of yours and he asked me to pass along a question to you. So he asked, sure. what, Okay, cool. So he said that he would want to know what your view is on the relationship between yourself and your character and how it's changed over the years. And then also how easy or difficult it has been for you to make a distinction between the two at different times. You know, it's so funny you say that because, you know, uh, Paige and I were talking the other night and, and I was talking about my first wife who was just an amazing human being. Yeah. And I said to, uh, as I told Paige, I said, you, you get the best Dallas Page ever, right? Like, because I'm, you know, as you get your age, you grow, you learn, you, you want to be a better person. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's who I am. And, you know, am I still <laughs> bombastic at times and over the top? That's who I am, you know, but Kimberly had to deal with me finding out who Diamond Dallas Page was and who I thought he was, this big over-the-top wrestling persona. And she had, and thank God she was so young, <laughs> because she had to deal with all the insanity. I'll tell you guys a, a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. You've seen Rudy, I'm guessing, right? Mm -hmm. right? Have you ever seen Hoosiers? I, I have Hoosiers. No, I have you, you should watch. It's a great. Yeah, it's a it's great. Right. Based on Bobby Knight. Yeah. Not really. Not based oh, really? on anybody. It's sure. more. Yeah. It's more a, a small town. A coach who was the Bobby Knight ish. And mm -hmm. this was before Bobby Knight had any issues. Yeah. Uh, and now he's at this high school instead of big time college. Right. And Gene Hackman. It won Oscar. I mean, it, you know, it was nominated like three different things. Mm -hmm. um, and he, this guy also wrote a movie called um, My All American. They're all based on, you know, the first, not, not Hoosiers, but Rudy and uh, My All American based on real real people. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, they're, they're three of the most inspiring sports movies that you'll find. Mm -hmm. uh, Rudy, who I've been working with and helped him get down, he's down about 30 pounds now, but he's called me the other day and said, D, D, no, it's coach. He always goes, coach, coach, I got to tell you, I just went up two flights of stairs to my buddy's house and I never touched the railing. Mm -hmm. Like that was a big deal for a 72 year old man mm -hmm. who's beat up. And when we got together and started working together, he's like, coach, coach, your life, it's a movie, it's a movie. And bottom line is Angelo Pizzo is now going to be starting to uh, to write my story, which is going to be pretty interesting. Wow. Wow. And it's getting made into yeah. a film? Well, first you write you write a script first. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one yeah. step at a time. Yeah. But uh, I'm super honored. Uh, and uh, I know it's going to be amazing because just some of the things that he said to me already. And uh He's just doing all this research right now. And he's like 72. 
or 73, I'm not sure, one of the two. And he, um, he, uh, you know, he's not traveling anywhere right now. He's waiting for the vaccination and all that stuff to come yeah. through. And I, I really think that, you know, I think the vaccination is going to be good just because there's no other way we're going to get to control this. Again, me, I live such a healthy lifestyle and I've already got the antibodies. I want to wait and see, make sure it doesn't turn people into zombies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Back back to your, your, your buddy's question. Um, Kimberly had it. You know, I had a tough time with me because I was really over the top at times. Um, but even by the time we got divorced, I was already, you know, way comfortable in who the next Dallas Page was going to, you know, be doing. And I was trying to be an actor. Yeah. And I still am. I have a series coming out uh, on Netflix probably around the middle of this year. And it's a very dark superhero um, drama series. And um, it's something I've been working on for 22 years, mm -hmm. you know, just as an actor. Right. Um, but I was an eight year overnight success as a wrestler. DDPY is an eight year overnight success. You know, as an actor, hopefully I'll be a 22 two year overnight success. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, I think that you become who you want to become. And that's what people don't understand. They don't understand that they get to control that. And again, I'm looking at my buddy. I know we're getting ready to close this out. Um, that's what me and him both do. We love being around each other, me and Mark Merrow. If you want to see a great video, is it called The Mother's Love, Mark? Yeah. The Mother's <laughs> Love. Mark, Mark um, he's, he's a speaker. Yeah. And he was speaking to kids and I've never seen anybody be able to grab on the ch kids, you know, grammar school kids, high school kids are they're really hard, but I seen him have them in the palm of his hand. And uh, I had Steve and the guys go down and film him one day. And then Steve took a piece of what his talk was about to the kids and it's called a mother's love. Mm -hmm. Just watch it. Um, it's, I want to say we tracked about a year ago, we tracked it and not just from our site, his site and other people's Facebook sites. It's got like a half a billion views. Wow. Like that video and Arthur's video got like a half a billion views. Mm -hmm. Both of them done by Steve Yu. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the guy, the guy just has, you know, he has his pulse, you know, on what people want and think and, you know, what they want to feel and that people want to be inspired. Absolutely. So an answer total question to your, to your buddy, it's I've become the exact person I want to be. Yep. And uh, Arthur Borman said, I've never met someone as comfortable in his skin as Dallas page. Mm -hmm. So that's who I've become. I love that. I was wondering if I could ask you one last question before you head out. One last question. Let's do it. So, um, this is from one of my best friends, uh, Mike Feeling. Uh, he said, uh, what long-term effect, if any, do you think the crowdless era has on wrestling? Zero. Mm. I think that wrestling fans will be around forever. I think they've figured out a way to work around it. I would have hated it. Like I said, my anniversary is in two more days on my last match. I would not have done it with no people. Yeah. Because it was about the people to me. But they figure out a way. The ratings aren't that much off right. when they had people. You know, so um, I think Cody and, and the boys over at AEW, Tony Khan, are doing a hell of a job. I think that, uh, you know, people get really opinionated on WWE. But the stuff that I've seen, like, you know, they're doing a good job. I love what my buddy Drew McIntyre is doing. You know, um, I think when the crowds can come back, the first people that will be back and won't give a shit mm -hmm. are the wrestling fans. Yeah. I think the wrestling fans and the football fans. Now, the football fans fill a whole arena. So that will be interesting because you're talking about, you know, 60, 80, 100,000 people. You know, for wrestling, we're talking about 
couple thousand or 20,000. Right. Um, but I think wrestling fans will be the first ones to jump in there and actually uh, take it to a different level. So listen, boys, um, I'd appreciate if you guys would talk about it occasionally over this next couple of weeks about Relentless, um, as you know, super inspiring. And if you've never seen the resurrection of Jake the Snake, you'll see him. If you watch one, the other one's going to pop yeah. up. Um, I would appreciate you guys putting a uh, review up there because I want to hear what people think. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to read you this last thing, and this is a review. And it's become my favorite review because it's so honest. And um, this guy writes, so how do we get out of this? Get out of that one. All right. Review, review, Amazon review. Okay. It's called Simply Inspiring. And he said, admittedly, for the first few moments, excuse me, admittedly, there were a few moments when I felt like I was watching the most well-produced infomercial ever. <laughs> None the, <laughs> I told you, honest, bro. And that's what I love. But listen what he writes after that. Nonetheless, it's pretty damn epic. And in these unstable times, it's quite inspiring to see how the positive intent behind DDPY rippled out into the world to create a positive change. I've had the DVD set sitting around for quite a while. Remember, honesty, he says, I've had the DVD set sitting around for quite a while, but I think I'll finally try it out instead of merely having it and pretending that's good enough. <laughs> the DDPY crew is making the world a better place. And this film documents that fact. That's a powerful review as far as And I've had reviews on that are insane. But that's one of my favorite because it's so raw, yeah. you know, and real and... If you do a document, a documentary or a film about Steve Jobs, what's it going to be all about? What? Yeah, Steve Jobs, what's it going to be about? Yeah, the phone and the computer. Apple. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look, yeah. Apple. Mm -hmm. Apple, Apple, Apple. <laughs> Macintosh. Yeah. You know, it's all going to be if you're doing a, if you're doing a story about Diamond Dallas Page, it's going to have a lot to do with wrestling. And DDPY. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. Anybody who wants to try the program, you can actually just try it, not buy the DVDs. Get the app, go to ddpy.com, ddpyoga.com. They both work. Get the app, try it for seven days. And at some point, you're going to understand there is no try, there is only to do it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, man. boys. All right. I'm out of here on that. And shout out to Mark Merrill. He does phenomenal work too. His speeches are sensational, man. No, no thank you. Yes, I will. I will tell him because I got the headphones on. I'll I got tell you. him you said that. Right. Thank right, you guys. so so much, Take man. Care, man. Have a great day, guys. All right, man. See you too. Bye. We said I'm still. No, yeah, there we go. All right, guys, that was awesome. That was so good. <laughs> right, so if you want to follow us, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on on Facebook and on Instagram at Seize underscore Podcast on Twitter. Like, like subscribe, subscribe, hit the bell, bell on YouTube. You can also find us at the O4L Online Network at O4LOnlineNetwork.com under the STM podcast section. Shout out to our guy, Vegas Media Designs. We were going to ask a question of his. Unfortunately, didn't have the time. You can find him on Instagram at Vegas Media Designs. He's a dope dude, does all of our artwork for us. Also, shout out to Andy O4L and Heart of an Outlaw. They're doing big things there. You can find them on O4L as well. All right, guys. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.